Thank you very much. Again, uh, we will proceed to the questions in the end. May we introduce now Professor Sulin from the University of Philadelphia. He's going to talk about embolotherapy and uh, what uh, we should choose. Uh, should we do bland, should we do cocktails or bead, and if all of this uh, have any difference, uh, significant, significantly different. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here, and I thank very much the PAIRS program organizers for uh, inviting us. Uh, I'm the, uh, currently the past chairman of the board of directors of the WCIO, and we're very excited about having this collaboration. Dr. Kalekas is our director of international education for WCIO, um, and this is really very an exciting opportunity to be here uh, for many reasons. Uh, these are my disclosures. I'm an equal opportunity consultant. I work with anybody. Um, so I actually have no particular biases, and I do all forms of embolotherapy. So um, I'm kind of be, try to be as fair and balanced about it. Um, this is why I'm really happy to be here. This was Monday morning before I left. Uh, on the left is my bedroom thermometer. You'll notice that's Fahrenheit. So it was zero degrees Fahrenheit, which is negative something Celsius. I don't know what. And that's the picture out the back window of my house uh, before I left. So you can imagine why I'm very happy to be in Dubai. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with WCIO, it's a uh, global organization uh, devoted to the growth of interventional oncology worldwide. Uh, we're not a society. There's no membership. There's no dues. It's an open community. Uh, IO Central uh, is our website, and I welcome anyone to come please uh, check it out if you have not before. Uh, all you need to do to access the content of IO Central is just have a login and a password. There's no money and there's no spam. Um, but uh, if you want to be able to interact with the various functions, you do have to log in on site. Um, we have a case of the week, so every week there's a new educational case that's, that's put up with discussion questions, and you can interact with it and post your own comments and questions. Um, we have, of course, the programs from our own uh, National uh, Scientific Congress. Uh, we have a monthly newsletter that comes out summarizing the latest developments in the industry. Um, there's my, my blog, which you're... I'm actually writing the one about this meeting as we speak, sitting in the audience. Um, and then we have discussion forums on many topics within interventional oncology, so ablation, embolization, uh, clinical care, which you're welcome to engage in. So I, I really would ask any of you to uh, take a look at iocentral.org, check us out, and please join the world community. So switching to what I'm supposed to be talking about, which is the various ways of embolizing the liver. Um, and we have to kind of go way back in time to look at the history of this. Uh, most embolization for HCC around the world is still done with lipiodol-based chemoembolization. Uh, lipiodol is actually one of the oldest human pharmaceuticals. So it came out in 1901, so it's been on, used as a human ph pharmaceutical for over 110 years. And it was really developed as a way of delivering iodine therapy to patients to treat a variety of infections, arthritis, and goiters. Um, and then after it had been injected for about 25 years and then the x-ray was developed, people realized this was radio-opaque. And it became one the actual, the first approved ionated contrast medium uh, was lipiodol. In 1951, the ultrafluid, the less viscous ethyl ester, was developed, um, which could be used intravascularly uh, and for lymphography and also for intramuscular injection. And in fact, in the 80s, there's an oral form, so you can take lipiodol as a pill primarily to treat iodine deficiency. So whoever thought to inject lipiodol in the liver? So the first description of using lipiodol was actually injection in the portal vein. This is from a group of surgeons in Japan who uh, injected, uh, surgically cut down, through a cut down, injected lipiodol through the mesenteric vein to opacify the liver parenchyma and then took x-rays. And what happened was the lipiodol opacified the normal liver parenchyma and the tumors appeared as defects in the contrast. So it was a way of diagnosing space occupying lesions in the liver by using lipiodol injection and conventional x-ray. And then the same principle was applied into arterial injection by, by Gerbet, uh, son of the original Gerbet um, in France, who did 12 patients where they injected lipiodol in the hepatic artery and then took x-rays and found that the tumors actually took up selectively and retained the lipiodol and so could be used as a positive contrast agent as opposed to a negative contrast agent. And then in the 1980s, it was uh, developed into a drug delivery platform by Professor Kono in Japan, who used lipiodol ejected through the hepatic artery mixed with chemotherapy drugs and observed that the lipiodol would get selectively taken up and retained in the hepatomas with the drug for several months. And so the first publications of using this as a chemoembolic therapy to treat liver cancer came out in the early 1980s. 
So what was the basis for this? Well, you have to understand what the blood supply is to hepatomas. So our conventional thinking since the 1950s is that the tumors are supplied by the hepatic artery, whereas the normal liver parenchyma is primarily supplied by the portal vein. And that's true in terms of where the blood comes from, but that's not true in terms of how the blood gets there. So in fact, when you look at the tumor level, the blood does not enter the tumors from the hepatic artery. Rather, the blood comes from the hepatic artery and it passes through the peribiliary capillary plexus, shunts into the terminal hepatic sinusoids, and from the sinusoids, it enters the tumor. So the blood comes from the hepatic artery, but it's not arteries that feed the tumor, it's actually veins that feed the tumor through this plexus. Meanwhile, the low pressure portal blood coming from the normal portal veins is sort of deflected around by all this high pressure arterial blood that's being shunted in the tumor. And this was shown very elegantly by uh, Zuckerman and Kahn and MD Anderson back in the early 1980s in animal models, both of HCC and of metastases, where they took the living animal, they exteriorized the liver with the tumor in it, and they transilluminated the liver and actually videoed by injecting fluorescent dye. So here's a tumor, here's a terminal portal vein, you're feeding it, they inject dye in the portal vein, and you see is that the portal vein lights up very briskly, or the terminal sinusides do, but you can actually get very little contrast uh, into the tumor itself, even at equilibrium. You take a different tumor, again, the feeding vessel is a terminal portal vessel, uh, you inject in the hepatic artery, and you immediately light up the entire tumor. So it comes from the artery, but it shunts into the veins. So why is this important? Well, it affects what happens when you embolize them. So if you embolize a patient with particles, no matter how small the particle you use, the final endpoint is about 200 microns. That's the level of vessel you end up including in the liver in our 200 micron arterioles. So that's proximal to the level of the peribiliary capillary plexus. And so you may cut off the arterial inflow to the tumor, but you preserve portal flow, which takes over and continues to perfuse the tumor and perfuses the daughter nodules, which are not arterialized yet. If you use a liquid agent, such as lapiodol, that will cross through the peribiliary capillary plexus. It will fill the vasculature of the tumor, and then you can use particles at the end to just cut off the arterial blood flow to keep the liquid agent from washing out. So that's the principle behind using an oily-based embolic platform. So does this matter? Well, in fact, if you look at tumor necrosis on explants, it does. So remember, lapidol is just a contrast agent. It's not a therapy. So lapidol alone, which can be used for diagnosing HCC, doesn't kill the tumor. It just gets retained in it. If you mix drug doxorubicin with lapidol, you get more tumor necrosis in main tumors and donologies, but really you don't get effective kill of most of the tumor just by using the oily platform alone. You have to add the gel foam. You have to add the embolic agent at the end to trap the liquid agent in the tumor, and then you'll get necrosis of most of the major tumors and many of the daughter nodules. So you might ask, well, maybe it's not the lapidol, maybe it's the particle occlusion that's really killing the tumor. So you can turn the question around. What if we ask the question the other way? What if you use just drug and gel foam and no oil versus adding the lapidol? So this is a survival study from Japan done in the late 1980s, 100 patients in each arm. And you can see this strong trend to improve survival with the triple combination of drug, oil, and particles. So you need the oil to act as a drug carrier to carry the drug into the cells, and then you need the particles to stop the blood flow and keep the liquid agent inside the tumor. And part of the reason for this is that the drugs we use actually are not lipophilic. So most drugs that we use, whether for hepatoma or for metastases, are hydrophilic. That means if you make, what you're creating is really an emulsion, okay? So you have oil droplets, but your drug is in the aqueous phase. There are some uh, lipophilic drugs that exist, for instance, in Asia, which will, where the drug will actually be in the oil droplets, and that's great because they get retained in the tumor. But most drugs we use, the anthracyclines, cisplatin, aminomycin, are lipophilic, and so they're out in the aqueous medium. So that means it's very important how you mix this. Okay? So you have to create an emulsion where you have a water-in-oil emulsion. So oil is the medium, the carrier, that's going to bring the drug-filled water droplets to the tumor. That means you have to match the specific gravity of your drugs, which are dissolved in contrast, a water-based contrast, to that of the lapidol, so you get a stable emulsion. Uh, and you need to have more oil than water so that the, you have a water-in-oil emulsion. So if you look at the work done by Cherry de Bear in Paris, this is looking at various particle sizes. And what you can't see without the color is this is 
just the aqueous phase, this is just the oil phase, and what you need is small droplets of water in oil. So when you inject it, the oil is the carrier, it takes the emulsion to the, to the cells, and then your drug is trapped in these little water droplets inside. If you have it the other way around, what happens is the drug's all out here in the aqueous phase, you have these droplets of oil, and the water just washes out. So you want to make a small water droplet in oil emulsion, and you do this by mixing them with the correct specific gravity and mixing them vigorously enough by hand that you create these very, very small droplets. And if you do that, what you'll get is excellent uptake and retention of the oil in the tumor. That will carry the drug with it, so you see this intense uh, oil deposition in the tumor. If you resect this tumor and measure doxorubicin levels, you'll find the drug in the tumor. And so what you end up with is actually an imaging biomarker for response. So if you do your CT afterward, you have excellent uptake and retention, and then you resect that, that tumor is dead. If you don't have complete lipidolization, you leave patchy oil uptake, but areas of viable tu of tumor here that doesn't have oil in it, when you resect it, where the oil is is dead, but where the oil is not is still viable tumor. And you can plot this, necrosis rate predicted by CT, against actual necrosis on pathology, and you have a pretty good correlation. So in fact, when you use the pi at all, if you follow up with CAT scans, your CAT scan is an imaging biomarker for tumor response. But it turns out it's even better than that, it's actually an imaging biomarker for survival. So if you look at what happens to patient survival, if you have more than 50% of your tumor taking, uh, taking up retaining the lipiodol, you triple your median survival in this French study from 10 years ago from 10 months to 30 months. So it actually is predictor of long-term outcome, and this early study was validated 10 years later, so this is a very large study from Korea, published two years ago, and they looked at excellent retention of lipiodol versus not excellent retention of lipiodol, and you can see in, if they took all their patients, they didn't even reach median survival in five years. More than half the patients were still alive if they retained the lipiodol well, whereas if they didn't, you can see much higher mortality, and that was true irrespective of child's class, A versus B, of TNN stage two versus three, any way you looked at it, good uptake of retention of the pyodol was a predictor of response and a predictor of survival. And in fact, this is the only technique that's actually been validated in randomized trials. So the two famous trials published in 2002, the Lowe study from Hong Kong, the Levet study from Barcelona, looking at either primarily hepatitis B or C patients with large multifecal tumors. And if you compared chemoembolization to best supportive care, there is significant improvement in survival uh, at one, two, and three years. Uh, and the interesting thing is remember that the although the uh, Lovett study was done with doxorubicin, the low study was done with cisplatinum. So two different drugs, but the same results prove that a lipidol-based chemobilization improves survival over best supportive care. Well, what about bland embolization? What about just embolizing the tumors and having no drugs at all? All right, that's a very controversial topic, and there are many people who argue that, frankly, most of the kill comes from ischemia. It's not from drug delivery, and so, in fact, adding the drugs may not matter that much. If you go back and look at the Lovett study, which was the one that showed the survival benefit of chemoembolization over best supportive care, in fact, this was the three-arm study. There was a bland arm in the study. But as soon as chemoembolization reached statistical significance, they closed the trial. So we never knew what happened in the bland arm. But if you look at the actual outcomes, you can see that the bland arm performed very similar to the chemoembolization arm. In fact, it just barely missed being significant, same three-year survival, and the hazard ratio was just a little bit worse than chemolization, didn't just barely cross one. So probably if they just kept going a little bit longer and added more patients, maybe the bland arm would have been significant too, but we'll never know. And if you look at major centers that do bland embolization, this is the results from Memorial Sloan Can Cancer Center in New York, who only does bland embolization, 300 patients. This is the results from my own institution, over 200 patients doing conventional three-drug chemoembolization, and I tried to present this so the scales are the same, and you can see to your eye that these curves look basically the same. So their results are almost identical to our results, bland embolization versus triple-drug chemoembolization. So in fact, it's very hard to make a compelling argument that chemoembolization is actually better than bland embolization, although they've never really had a good trial. So what do people really do? Well, this is the interim analysis from the Gideon Registry. So the Gideon Registry is a worldwide registry run by Bayer, looking at patients treated with serafinib. But they look at many, many fa factors of how people are treated for their HCC. And this is looking at how people are chemoembolized all around the world. And what you can see is that the number of patients treated with conventional lipidol case chemoembolization in Asia, Pacific, over 90%, Latin America, about 90%, Japan, 90%. But if you look at Europe, only 62% of patients still get lipidol-based chemobilization. And you look at the U.S., only 43%.
So what are people doing? Well, the problem is that over the last several years, there have been tremendous shortages of the ingredients that you need to make a chemobilization cocktail. So most of the powdered chemotherapy drugs that we've used historically for the last 20 years actually are not available anymore. No one makes powdered cisplatinum. Powdered doxorubicin is an extremely short supply. I haven't had it for almost a year at my own institution. And lapiodol, the only packager and seller of lapiodol in North America, stopped doing it in 2010. So we had a shortage of lapiodol as well, and in fact, now we have to import ours from France because there's still no one who packages and sells lapiodol in North America. So because of that, people started seeking other options, and the other option was the drug-eluting beads. So drug-eluting beads, if there are three different uh, companies that make drug-eluting microspheres on which you can load various drugs, Dr. Rubicin, Arena Tcan, inject that, and you're using the, drug pl the, the particle embolic platform as your drug delivery instead of lapiodol. And there have been a few comparative studies. So this was the Precision 5 trial out of Europe, uh, which was a very unfortunately designed study. The endpoint was six months imaging response, which is you know, a clinically meaningless endpoint. But nonetheless, that's what they looked at. And although they showed there was a trend toward a little bit better response with, the, in this case, the DCB product versus conventional chemobilization, in fact, it wasn't statistically different. Uh, so it looked a little better, but it really wasn't that much better at six months. And then look at a Malagari study from Greece. She took the drug-eluting bead platform and did a comparative study of the same particle with no drug. So basically, they used the same agent, bland, versus loading it with doxorubicin. And what you can see is after a year, absolutely no difference in survival in HCC patients. Not that they weren't different. They're actually the same. The curves completely track each other. So no difference at all whether you put the drug in or not. So what's happening with this platform? Well, what's happening is you're having no improvement in outcome and much higher complication rates. So in Malagari's study, 17% major hepatic complications with drug and microspheres versus only 2% in the bland group. And if you look at the large study from France, uh, where they looked at the rate of hepatic complications with lapidal chemobilization versus drug and microspheres, both for metastases and for HCC, a 10 to 1 ratio of increased biliary and hepatic injury using drug and microspheres. So what's going on? Well, remember we talked about the fact that particle embolization does not reach the tumor, right? So this is an MRI of the drug-eluting microsphere platform loaded with iron. So the iron shows a black on the MRI, and if you use the 300 to 500 micron size, you see that you don't even get to the tumor, right? You're, these particles are all lined up in the feeding artery, and they never even make it to where the tumor is. If you drop down to the 100 to 300 micron size, which is what most people use, you can see you now reach the tumor, but the particles are sort of ringing around it. They don't actually, very few particles make it into the tumor. They're not taken up inside it like lapiodol is, but they basically get stuck around the margin of the tumor. So if you remember, and then, so where's the drug? Well, the drug's on the beads, okay? So here's uh, beads stacked up in the artery in the liver, and here's a fluorescence micrograph, and the doxorubicin fluoresces bright red, and you can see here it is on the surface of the bead, and you can see how rapidly the concentration falls off. Really within one or 200 microns, you're down to less than 10% of the concentration of doxorubicin. So this is what's happening. If you remember our diagram before, your beads get stuck out here, all your drug is out here, and then it has to elude off the bead, and it has to diffuse all the way from here to here to get in the tumor, which not very much drug does. So what you're doing is you're delivering a lot of drug to liver and not that much drug to tumor. So if you look at the complication rates, the adverse events uh, with reported with drug eluting microspheres compared to the Society of Interventional Radiology quality improvement guidelines for what your thresholds, what you're supposed to get, 5.5% grade 4 to 5, even fatal biliary injury, the threshold is 4%. Why is that? Because you're getting hepatobiliary necrosis due to incredibly high levels of doxorubicin delivery to normal liver tissue. The, the, drug, the beads are sitting in the periobiliary capillary plexus, and that's where the drug comes off, and it gets the bile ducts first. Um, you, then you have all these non-target embolization, 5.5% cholecystitis versus you should see less than 1%, about a 2.5% rate of extra hepatic injury, which should be less than 1%, and that's because you can't see them. Right? So when you do lapidol chemoembolization, your agent is completely radiopaque. You watch it go in. You know it's going to the tumor. You know it's not going into the stomach. Drug-eluting beads are not opaque. You're just suspending them in contrast and injecting, but you actually have no idea where they're going. And so you get a much higher rate exceeding the QI guidelines for non-target injury. What about yttrium-90? Okay, so yttrium-90 is another very popular therapy. We've seen Therosphere mentioned already. Um, if you, there are, again, no head-to-head -head 
perspective trials, but if you look at some very large retrospective series, this is data from Riyadh Salam at Northwestern, who's done hundreds and hundreds of patients both ways. <coughs> so this is <coughs> a comparison. Over 200 patients, chemoembolized, over 200 patients with therosphere, and although they saw an improved time to progression with Y90, but what about intermediate stage patients, patients who could do chemoembolization, reembolization, ablation? Does there any benefit to adding a biological agent early? So multiple trials have been done or are ongoing in this, looking at chemobilization with serafinib, reomobilization with serafinib, and ablation and resection with serafinib. Uh, and these, the, most of them have not been reported yet, but this is the outcome from the, sp uh, the SPACE study, which was drug eluting B chemobilization randomized to serafinib or placebo, and again, no difference in survival. Uh, and that seems to be the way it's evolving. And in, in most of the studies that we, where we see the data so far, it's been reported at meetings, if you're have a patient who can get liver-directed therapy in more earlier or intermediate stage, adding the drug early doesn't seem to benefit. Not that it doesn't do something, it's just the magnitude effect of serafinib is so small compared to the magnitude effect of embolotherapy that the difference is just lost in the, in the noise of the trial. So to answer the question I was asked, does it make any difference how you embolize? Probably not. But there's some caveats to that. So remember, Every patient is an individual, you're treating the individual. So there's definitely circumstances. So, you know, the average patient comes to my clinic with HCC or metastatic disease. You know, basically, if there's no specific contraindications, we discuss chemobilization, we discuss reembolization, and since they work about the same, I let them decide. But there are some patients where you should have an opinion. So if they have significant other organ compromise, cardiac, hematologic, renal insufficiency, they can't get chemotherapy. Right? I mean, that would be too toxic. So you're going to do bland embolization or maybe radio embolization because it's much less toxic and better tolerated. Um, if they have extrahepatic collaterals, which we'll talk about later today, bland embolization is very, very risky to deliver chemotherapy or even radiotherapy through extrahepatic collaterals, although it's definitely been done. Um, if limiting post-embolization syndrome is a priority, so for example, when you do chemobilization, most people have to be in the hospital for a day or two, they're debilitated for a few weeks, so a frail patient or a patient who's a caretaker for a family member, you know, someone who can't afford to be out of work for a couple weeks, you want to do something like yttrium 90 because they'll be able to tolerate that and have that therapy as an outpatient. If they had a Whipple or a biliary stent, all right, that puts them at extremely high risk for liver abscess formation with chemobilization or bland embolization. So again, I would do Y90 in those patients because it has a much lower risk of hepatic abscess afterward. So thanks very much for your attention. Thanks again for having us here. And I hope many of you will be able to join us in New York in May for our meeting. Thank you, Michael. I think uh, you will generate a lot of discussion with your presentation. So, uh, as we have an issue, uh, Professor Rick uh, uh, has a flight problem, so we, his talk will be moved to the, uh, to, the next to the next group of presentations. I think the floor is uh, open for discussion and questions to the uh, speakers. Any questions? I want to ask Dr. Michael about the... Could you raise your voice, please? I want to ask about the uh, role of chemoembolization in the presence of arterial portal shunts, and uh, how would you manage these shunts? Thank you. Okay, so, so the question was, if you're doing chemoembolization, what do you do if you see gross arterial portal shunting on your angiogram? Very common in HCC. You know, about 25% will already have macrovascular portal vein invasion. But even without, you can see a lot of shunting, sometimes just from bad cirrhosis. So the problem with that is if you're doing a liquid-based agent like lipiodol, it may pass right through the shunts and end up in the portal vein or in the lungs if there's hepatovenous shunting. So if you see that, you pretty much have to do bland embolization with some larger agent until, the shunt go, until you shut down the shunt. You can use gel foam slurry. You can use large particles, 5 to 700, 700 to 900. But you do that until you don't see obvious shunting anymore. Uh, and then if you're using a lipiodol-based chemobilization, what you do is you can start injecting, and you just look and see, do you see oil in the portal veins or oil in the lungs? Uh, and if you do, you just have to stop. Now, sometimes what happens is you have to do so much bland embolization to get the shunt to go away that you've also embolized the supply of the tumor, and you, then you can't inject your chemoembolic, which is okay, because what you do is you just bring them back in two or three weeks and do another angiogram, and then you'll see the blood flow of the tumor, but usually you won't see the shunt. So that's pretty much, you know, the key is, if you see shunting, just do bland embolization with something big first 
until the shunts are gone. And then either chemo like then or, or at a later time. But you don't want to, you have to be very careful. And then, especially if you're doing drug leading microspheres, this, the, especially the smallest ones, you know, the new ones that are 400 to 40 to 100 microns, or you're doing therospheres, surspheres, which are also in the 25 to 40 micron range, you know, those will go right through the shunts. And they won't stay. They'll, so they either all be, end up in the portal vein or they'll end up in the lungs, which is really bad. Yeah, you get, yeah, sometimes, well, it depends. So you, you, you often, it's not unusual to have to go to two sessions because it depends how bad the shunting is, but sometimes by the time you embolize enough to not see the shunt anymore, you essentially have embolized the artery and you don't really see the arterial supply of the tumor. But, but if you just wait, give them like two weeks and then come back and do a second session, you'll usually see the tumor start to resupply, but the shunt will still be small enough that you can do the embolization. That's a, it's a common challenge. Well, Michael, first of all, welcome to Dubai, and we're looking forward for a Paris WCIO cooperation for years to come, hopefully. My question actually involves you and Dr. Tabashi as far as the focused ultrasound uh, ablation. First of all, both of you, what's your input on how practical is the thing? And like we discussed yesterday at dinner, is the bones, are they really, uh, uh, do they have an impact on the practicality of this technique or not? Uh, uh, high force ultrasounds can be used uh, by MR uh, by the motion uh, suppression, either suppression or tracking. Also, some uh, reported cases by reprosection. We can do reprosection to uh, uh, wide the window between the, uh, the sonication and the liver. So you don't, you don't, I mean, do you think the practicality of it is impeded by the fact that we have a lot of ribs, especially in the, uh, through the anterior approach uh, to the it's tumor? Actually, it's actually a uh, uh, hard technique to do. Michael, what do you think? Mm -hmm. I think you have a different point of view there. <laughs> well, I, mean, I think the appeal is that it's not invasive. You don't, you're not even putting a needle in the patient. So as a concept, I think HIFU is very exciting. You know, if you think about how intravenous oncology will evolve. In the short term, it's going to be computational technology, guidance and targeting. But in the 10 years, the therapy will turn, we'll be able to treat people completely non-invasively. So for instance, in my research lab, we use ultrasound contrast agents loaded with drugs. So we build the drug into the ultrasound contrast agent, you inject it intravenously, it goes to the whole body, but you just ultrasound the tumor. And then the contrast agents burst in the tumor and release the drug. So non-invasive drug delivery. HIFU is non-invasive thermal delivery. So it's a great concept. You just have to overcome this challenge in the liver. Right. You need ribs and lungs in the back. Yes, yes. You know, if you can do, so I guess some people use, I don't know if you use jet ventilation. Some people have done this with yes. jet ventilation. Yes. And you push the diaphragm way down, yes. you're an anesthesiologist, and, and get the liver down below the, the lung and the rib. So there, but I mean, there's no question it's very, challenging, and the people who do it well spend a lot of time and energy yes. and high technology yes. to, to, to do it. So it's, it's going to be, it's, it's difficult. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you both. Thank you. Professor Lepp, yeah. Yes, so I would like to ask Professor Mohammed Subail and uh, if anybody of the panel chair with us the point of down staging. Because down staging is very appealing uh, idea for all people who are presented with unresectable. And then uh, Professor Mohammed telling us that he used in King Faisal some biological uh, agent like sorafenib. My question is, is it for how long? And if we have some response, at what point we change decision and send to surgery because sometimes if we still continue the medicine sometimes it, it progress under the medicine and did you ever try chemoembolization as down staging because uh, in the National Cancer Institute and I have many many patients between me and the medical oncology and Professor Ikram Hamid in the intervention radiology we decided to give chemoembolization and the plan is either to respond and refer to surgery or continue with biological therapy. So the concept of downstaging. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, the issue of downstaging, I, th I think, uh, as you could see, the, uh, the experience worldwide is, uh, you know, a handful of cases, very small number of cases. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the concept is appealing. Uh, but as I said, if you are embarking on downstaging protocol, then you have really uh, to define exactly entry points, what kind of patient you are going to get in, 
at what stage you are going to accept uh, uh, a patient for transplant after downstaging, meaning uh, do you wait until, until they reach, for example, from T, T3 to uh, T2, for example, uh, and then uh, they should follow up and so on. So, you know, it's, uh, we, we, we did this on an individual uh, basis, a few, few number of patients, and the outcome has, be, has been good, as you could see. I mean, we didn't, ha we didn't, we didn't have a recurrence so far. The first patient we did was 2008. Uh, still, we have a small number of patients. But I think the concept is appealing, especially with uh, radio embolization, where we, where we, 90% uh, of our uh, local regional therapy is radio embolization, actually, and we have a lot of experience. Uh, Dr. Hibani is our uh, interventional radiologist, and he's been uh, doing this over the past four, four years now. Uh, uh, the explant, uh, we see complete necrosis of the tumor, as you could see. Uh, so the, the efficacy of this is, is really uh, 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 outstanding. But as I said, you know, um, you know if you are embarking on, on downstaging, it has to be done uh, appropriately in terms of uh, defining entry, uh, where, where do you uh, do. So what we are doing really is, is really piloting this and hoping to, to, to do a more number of cases in, in a more kind of controlled uh, uh, fashion. Thank you. Yes. Regarding my, my question to uh, Professor Solen. We are going again to giving uh, chemo mobilization, Dr. Obisain, drugs or no drugs again. You just said in your slides that if we have uh, to do bipartisan Inherently, I mean, you just can't get all the way to the tumor. Um, so I, you know, I tend to, in my own practice, do lapidol chemo mobilization with, now the only drug I have left is mitomycin C. No one's ever shown the drug matters, which drug you use. Um, but if you know, if you don't have lapidol, you know, I think, in theory, we think that there are you know, reasons why one approach might be better than the other, but in practice, you know, if you just look at the outcomes, given the heterogeneity of HCC patients, you know, some are big tumors, small tumors, many tumors, infiltrative tumors, I mean, you get a variety of outcomes. Um, and if you look across the population, on average, all the techniques seem to work similarly well. So I think you do what you can. Um, I have a personal bias that I like lapidol chemolization with multiple drugs, because that's just how I've mostly done it for 20 some years. Um, but in fact, when someone, if you really push me and said, is that better than bland? I can't prove it, right? I mean, there's really not good evidence that it's really superior in HCC. Now, I, we'll talk this afternoon about metastatic disease, which is a different story. Um, but this will not make the uh, bland embolization a step behind the conventional text. Well, you know, I would like to think that is true, but in fact, the people, and there aren't that many people who do bland embolization. So we're limited, you know, the Memorial Group in New York has historically, for 20 years, done bland embolization. You know, if you look at their data, it's very similar to mine. And if you look at their patient population, it's also very similar to mine. You know, we're both sort of large East Coast referral centers, so we get, in you know, if you look at the case mix we get, it's pretty similar. Um, you know, we do mostly BCLCC patients. More than 50% in my practice are BCLCC. Same thing at Memorial. Um, so, how could they explain how, how could they be embolizing material and go to the small size, which is 200 micro? Yeah. Well, so it doesn't, right? Um, so, but remember, you're not looking at the outcomes after a single therapy. I mean, we're looking, you know, remember, we're looking at overall survival, which after all is all the patient cares about, right? All the, the patients only care if they're alive or dead. They don't, you know, we care about what the x-ray looks like. It's a package. Right. It's a package, right. So, you know, you're not, it's not like you do one embolization and that determines the patient's fate. You know, if you are doing something and maybe there's some daughter nodules you're not getting and then six months from now you see them, we're going to go embolize them again and then again and then again and maybe you're going to do some RFA along the way and maybe you'll put them on serafinib. So, you know, if you look at the whole package of everything that we do, you know, the details of how you happen to embolize them turn out not to matter so much because if you look at overall survival, which is after all reflects everything we did for that patient over their lifetime, you know, we're not working in isolation, we don't really see much of a difference. Close it. There's one more. Yeah, we're one. not seeing lapidol on the tumor. You actually don't get as good a good response. But what you're not sure, no, normal liver tissue because if you if it is just because of a trapping of contrast. Well, you know, so you have more flow to the tumor than you do to liver. So hopefully more of your beads are going to the tumor than the liver. You also stop when you see that on your <coughs> angiogram. So I think you're making an excellent point. But if you actually track where the beads are by by doing something that images the beads, so people have done the MR studies with the iron labing, etc. You know, you see that, that, you know, most of them are not actually in it. And if you do, if you look at the histology in patients with explanted, you definitely have some beads in the tumor, but most of them are kind of ar around the edges of the tumor. So it gets to it. 
And then, so that's why there's all this interest in the, in the M1, you know, the smaller platforms. So the 40 to 100 micron size, what we're hoping is they'll overcome that limitation. Now you'll actually get all the way out much more penetration in the tumor. And that's probably true, but the problem is once you get to 40 to 100 microns, you know, 40 is a, almost the size of sur spheres, right? You know, it's small enough that you're going to start, now you're going to start getting shunting. So some, some people have argued if you're doing 40 to 100 size drug microspheres, you should actually do MAA studies like you would for Therosphere first and make sure they're not going to shunt. Now, in, in fact, the manufacturing of the beads, if they say it's 40 to 100, they're very, very tightly clustered in the middle. I mean, they're mostly, whatever that is, 80, 85, something like that. There aren't that many that are small, but there are enough that there have actually been some cardiac deaths with M1 chemobilization or very severe cardiopulmonary complications that happen afterward. And presumably that's because the smaller beads, in fact, were shunting and ending up in the lungs. So, you know, we're sort of pushing the embolic size smaller, trying to get to the tumor. And we're, the price for that is the risk of then shunting through the tumor, some of them, and delivering your therapeutic agent outside of it. So it's a very interesting challenge. I have another question, if you allow me. Yeah, we have time. Yeah. Uh, the other question is with regard to the, uh, the, to the reduction of the uh, arteriopartial shunting in the tumor. I mean, you talked about, I mean, embolizing with it, but I mean, how about sorafenib? I mean, because yeah, some that, centers they recommend, you know, that, that is an, e an excellent point. So if you do, and that applies to therosphere therapy as well. So whether you're seeing arterial portal shunting grossly on an angiogram when you want to do chemobilization, or you're planning therosphere therapy and you do your MAA study and there's too much shunting to the lungs, if you put them on serafinib and repeat your study and I don't know how many weeks are in the, in the papers, I mean, maybe four. There are people, so, so become, I mean, they recommend about, I mean, uh, six to maybe uh, six yeah. weeks or two, three months, up to three months. Yeah, then you, you get, you know, decreased angiogenesis. Yeah, that's an excellent point. So sometimes therapinib therapy will enough to decrease the shunting. Um, arterial portal shunting and arterial pulmonary shunting to the opinion being. So that's definitely a, a good use for serafinib. You know, some people do amazingly well on serafinib. Uh, you know, some, some not so much. But I think it's a drug that people should be very, you know, if you're treating HCC, you should be very comfortable managing patients on serafinib. Even if you're an interventional radiologist, you know, I mean, it's a pill, you can prescribe it, right? So, you know, you should be able to offer it to patients you think will benefit and you should be able to manage the side effects of serafinib. Um, you know, in, in your practice, or if you're not comfortable, work closely with someone who is. Uh, but I think it's a very useful. Uh, and then, and there are some patients. I have a, just very few who showed up with really bad prognosis HCC. I mean, macrovascular invasion, uh, metastases, and you put them serafinib, and two years later, they're they're doing great, and they just had this amazing response. It's very rare, but you know, it does happen. So why not try? Well. Um Go, yes. My, my question is again to Professor Solon. Regarding the, uh, the some advocates that if you have uh, not non-typical uh, HCC in the imaging with the low arterial uh, flow, this hinders the uh, arterial uh, therapy. Whatever, chemoembolization, taste, space, you, they will be in the non-good non responsive uh, side. What's your experience regarding this? And the, the uh, a comment on just the third sphere or using uh, serafinib and doing it to, to reduce the shunt. We need, we need the healthy status for the vessels to drive the, uh, the, uh, the drug to the, uh, to the, uh, to the lesion. And uh, also, uh, we have a bad, uh, if we do it early with a patient with serafinib, we might have dissection, we might have uh, some problem during the technique. Uh, so is it wise to do it that short from? Right, so I mean, I think you use serafinib in patients where there's excessive vascularity, right? So it's the patients with shunting, um, you know, so you're not worried about I mean, patients who don't have that, you wouldn't necessarily routinely put them on serafinib ahead of time. Now, if you can combine the two, I mean, all the studies so far, uh, Geshwin study out of Hopkins with juggling beads, uh, the ECOG study so far, ECOG 1208, which is the randomization of conventional chemobilization with serafinib placebo, and also the SPACE study that was like completed with the DC beads, you know, basically all of them showed that it was safe to combine serafinib and chemobilization at the beginning. So it's not like they've been on it for months and had their vascularity changed beforehand. Uh, I haven't seen very many people come in for angiography who've already been on serapinib for a very long time because it's so atypical. You know, usually if they're eligible for embolotherapy, you do that first. But you can certainly combine the two. Uh, Serapinib is good for decreasing excess vascularity. The concern with sort of the hypovascular tumor, that's a concept that 
in real life, I don't really believe in. But, so hypovascularity is, a, is, a, is an imaging concept. All right, so, uh, but in fact, in real life, almost all malignancies in the liver are hypervascular and hypermetabolic relative to the normal liver tissue. All right. So if you're going to do an arterial-based therapy, it's going to target those lesions. That includes cholangiocarcinoma. I mean, cholangiocarcinomas classically, you know, are really not very vascular at all on imaging. And yet, they respond beautifully, and they have very good uptake of arterial-directed therapies. So I, I don't find the, I mean, the vascular of the tumor doesn't really influence me in terms of, of therapy uh, with, with an embolization. I think you'll target it very, very well. Uh, no matter how vascular or hypovascular. Now, whether the less vascular tumors don't respond as well, it's not a question that's been very well studied. It might be true. Um, but what else are you going to do? You're still going to treat the patient. So it sort of becomes a prognostic factor, maybe. Um, but what I always tell patients when they come in is, you know, you have the prognosis you walk in the door with, right? So maybe you have macrovascular invasion, which most people agree is a bad prognostic sign. But the one thing you don't know when you walk in the door is how you're going to respond to treatment, right? So if you have an outstanding response to embolotherapy, you just completely change their prognosis. So that's why, like, you know, if you look at Lovett's triage, do they say BCLCC patients don't go for embolotherapy? They should just get serafinib. But most of the patients I treat are BCLCC because, in fact, it works very well. I mean, just because someone went from a BCLB to a C doesn't mean their liver cancer is not going to respond to what I do. It's just they walk in the door with the worst prognosis. So, you know, what Lavette's doing in Barcelona is rationing, right? He's just rationing care. He's saying, for this relatively expensive therapy, if you come in with a very advanced prognosis where I don't expect on average you to gain that much benefit, we're not going to offer it to you. Not that it doesn't work. It's just that you're not going to live for a year. You know, but in the United States, you know, it's a, you know, like baseball. You get to go down swinging. You know, if you have insurance that will pay for it, you can get whatever you want. And so people come in with bad disease. I have patients come in with macrovascular invasion, the tumor going to the main portal vein, but if you chemoembolize them or do therosphere and that tumor dies, you just made them into a bee, you know, and they'll live for a year, two years, but you don't know until you try. So, you know, I think you, you're going to treat them with what you can and they'll either respond or they, you know, in any individual case, it's what happens in that patient that matters. I hope that answered your question. It was sort of complicated. <laughs> but I don't believe in hypovascularity. I mean, that doesn't affect my therapy at all. Um, the safety with being on drugs, serafinib, safe. Avastin is a problem. Avastin is a big problem. So we make them stop Avastin. It's not clear that it's really a safety issue with chemolization, but definitely the problem with the fragile arteries and the small vessels. Um, and in colorectal cancer, you know, those patients have been on chemotherapy for six months. They have really crappy vessels. You prefer to wait for one, one week for the day? Um, for which pa For serafinib, we don't. No, we don't. No, we used to, but no, we don't anymore because it's not a safety issue. So we don't stop for serafinib. Avastin, we stop. Usually four to six weeks. Well, um, before we thank all the speakers and announce the official closure of the session, we would like to ask you to please massively attack the exhibition area of our sponsors because this is and show them interest. Of, it's net. Thank you very much for the speakers. Thank you for your attendance. And be back on time at 1 o'clock, please. Thank you. Lunch boxes will be served in this area after the exhibition uh, round. To, to uh, Cirrosphere, the flexible and controlled delivery of, uh, of CERT.